I am Nisha Botway, the Dean of the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs. And it is my distinct honor um, and pleasure to welcome all of you here today, especially Dr. Siabula. I'm sorry, I'm gonna pause and say it properly. I'm gonna say it properly, Dr. Siabulela Mandela, the Regional Project Manager for East and South Africa at Journalists for Human Rights, as well as Angela Rose, who is a former Minneapolis NAACP president, and Mark Ritchie, who is president of Global Minnesota. Judge Lejeune Lang, will, uh, who retired from the Fourth Judicial District Court here in Minnesota as a senior fellow with the Humphrey School's Roy Wilkins Center for Human Relations and Social Justice, will moderate a discussion with our guests today. Welcome to you all. I also want to mention that we have a high school group in the audience with us today, and we are so excited to have you here as well. I understand uh, you have a little bit of time to tour the University of Minnesota, and perhaps this will be the highlight of your time, and you'll uh, find your way to the U of M as you matriculate uh, from high school. We are thrilled to have Dr. Mandela here with us at the Humphrey School where we strive to understand, research, and address global challenges, where activism ignites students and the future public policy leaders we help send out into the world. Today, we will discuss some of those challenges, or what I call wicked problems. Wicked problems faced by societies, that policies, systems, and environmental changes are key to moving us forward. That does not happen without the activism that we will discuss today. What roles can activists, citizens, and students play in upholding the values of human rights around the world? How do we stay informed and act when needed? These are critical questions as we see our world experience continued conflicts and crises. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Mandela. Dr. Mandela earned his PhD in international relations and conflict management. He has deep connections to social justice movements around the world, like his late grandfather, the late former president of South Africa and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Nelson Mandela. Before I turn it over to Dr. Mandela for his remarks and then the panelist discussion, I'd like to invite our viewers and guests to take this opportunity to listen. Take this opportunity to listen. Think about what you're hearing, consider this as an invitation to spend time listening. Listen to our panelists, listen to Dr. Mandela, and consider using the chat for those online and the questions for those in this audience for sharing resources, but also sharing perhaps the questions and comments that you think are really gonna allow us to build the bridge, to build the next step, to move us forward so we can have the courage to do the important work of activism to advance the common good in our diverse world. If you uh, have a question, please put those in the Q&A, those who are online. Um, there's a feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen for that. Uh, the chat function is enabled for comments. Uh, and so now, welcome to the stage, Dr. Mandela. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the distinguished guests, if you allow me to take an opportunity to first and foremost, if the dean allows me, of course, and the audience maybe if they allow me, I don't mind if you don't allow me anyway, um, I'm going to take a very decolonial approach into my introduction. I appreciate the colonial way of introduction, but there is a way uh, in which I would like to introduce myself. 
And I would explain the reason why it is of paramount importance that I always introduce myself in that particular manner and fashion. Now you are standing in front of you is the descendant of King Benguga from the kingdom of the Tembu people, which is geographically located in the eastern parts of South Africa, and that is the Eastern Cape. I hail from the Tembu kingdom, which its configuration is made up of five houses. The first house is the house of uh, Dalin Yebo, and the second house, the house of Matanzi Mangeni, is the third house. Uh, and the fifth house, where which is the house that I come from is the house of Mandela. It's not Mandela, it's Mandela. And within that house, I stand as I am appearing before you today, I stand in the shoulders of my ancestors and that is Madiba Sopicho Yemyem Olumsila Zondazjaba Nobazgam Zondangekesmezen. It is of critical importance for me to locate my genealogy and who I am and where I come from. And to recognize that as I appear before you today, I am standing in the shoulders of great giants of African history, the people that have made significant contribution in the Tembu Kingdom and in the house of Mandela in its entirety. Now it is of critical importance because we live in the world where for a longest of time, we have been stripped off of our identity, of our dignity. We have been stripped off of our language who, and we have allowed ourselves to be defined by others of who we are and what is our place in this universe. And I said this, and I'm going to say it once again. In the last address that I had at an uh, event organized by the Makati Center, I said, if you were to take a moment and pause, and you look at your fellow, maybe someone next to you, an African-American or an African uh, who finds themselves in this American soil, who probably do not have a privilege to introduce themselves in the manner in which I am introducing myself. It's because they were denied of that particular right by the oppressive, violent, and vicious systems such as colonialism, such as slavery, that have denied them an opportunity and that right to introduce them in the manner in which I am introducing myself. So it is of critical importance. We always take note of the kind of trauma and the kind of pain that they go through as they navigate themselves in this country and in this world as a whole. So that is me, ladies and gentlemen, a very introduction to decolonial history of Africa 101, if we have any history students among us. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to stand in front of all of you uh, these lights kind of confuse me a bit, but it's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get used to them. Um, it is indeed a privilege, uh, more so because I am speaking uh, in front of my fellow colleagues, the leaders of today and the leaders of tomorrow. And if we are to bring uh, any change that we want to see in this world, you are the people that are responsible uh, you are the people that are entrusted with that change. So therefore I call you my colleagues because together we are in a mission and in a purpose. Maybe we might define it a little bit later as we engage in the panel. It is an honor, of course, uh, I would like to extend gratitude to the University of Minnesota and the school here for giving us this platform to have this discussion. I won't be long, I might be long in my introduction, but in my remarks, I'll be very short. I would also like to extend gratitude to the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civil Engagement that has given me an opportunity and a platform to be doing work with them where we were teaching a course on global activism, youth and social movements. And I am mostly grateful to the director, which is uh, Dr. Matt, who is here with us. And I think they've 
provided us with such a wonderful platform to talk about most probably most uncomfortable topics that we'll prob probably be talking about, especially in a space and in a state such as Minnesota. So it is an honor and a privilege. And to the students that are here, I hope you will be inspired. I'll try and do my best to inspire you. Um, as I was called and invited to come and make remarks here, particularly on the topic of human rights activists at the crossroads in, not at the crossroads, in the front lines of conflict. I was beginning to look at what is currently happening in the world today, uh, particularly one of the key events that I think are of paramount importance for some of the issues that I'll be raising to you today. It's one, the pandemic uh, itself, and secondly, the war that is currently happening in Europe. It makes me to look at the world and say, we are as the world actually at crossroads. And at this crossroad, there's one question that comes into my mind, given what has been happening globally. And that question is quite simple. Whose rights matter? And now I ask this question because what I have observed in the events that have been happening in the global scale is that when the declaration of, the universal declaration of human rights was proclaimed on the 10th of December, 1948 in Paris and adopted by the UN General Council, it laid down different articles. And one of those key articles that I think are of critical importance for the benefit of this conversation is Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3 of the Declaration of Human Rights. And what you see is Article 1 speaks of everyone being born free, equal, in dignity and in human rights. And Article 2 speaks of everyone being afforded access to the freedoms and the human rights as articulated in the declaration. And Article 3 speaks of everyone having the right to life. And now the question that I'm going to pose to you is, is the Declaration of Human Rights as we know it, protecting, does it protect the rights of all humans or does it protect the rights of a particular group in the human family? And the answer that I'll give you is, the declaration was made in 1948. It, was, it coincided with the year where South Africa shifted from colonial system to a more vicious and violent system of oppression, the apartheid system. It would take us almost 50 years before we are afforded the rights as so well articulated in the Declaration of Human Rights. And it also to me begs the question of in all these 50 years, whose rights were so important in the human family? And it is clear to me that those that were afforded when they speak of universal declaration of human rights, they were talking about those of Caucasian descent, particularly white people being given the right to life, being given the right to be equal, to be treated with dignity. 
And the rest of us, particularly those of African descent, were never given an opportunity to enjoy the similar rights as so well articulated in that declaration. It would take us 50 years, almost 50 years, 46 years to be exact, which is in 1994 up until we were given an opportunity to enjoy to a certain degree, as limited as they are, the rights as declared in that particular 1948 document. And now if I'm going to bring it closer to more contemporary issues that currently bedevil the world as we know it today, the pandemic and the current war in Europe between Ukraine and Russia has actually exposed once again, both these two events have actually exposed once again the question of who, whose rights matter in the world today. And it is clear to me and you that the rights of people of African descent, the rights of people of color are not recognized in the systems of government, neither are they protected by that universal declaration of human rights. For us, many of people of African descent, people of color, that is a mere document with empty promises. For many of my people have been suffering for hundreds of years. If you are looking at social movements of today, such as Black Lives Matter, they come precisely, they were born precisely out of that frustration that if you're talking about human rights, you are talking about the rights of people of white Caucasian background. You are not talking about black people. You are not talking about people of color. And now I, I, I know this kind of discussion might be upsetting to many, but the reality is, if you are looking at Ukraine, for instance, and the war that happens between Russia and Ukraine, where they were talking about evacuating people out of Ukraine, they were talking about evacuating white people out of Ukraine, black students from African continent were denied access to trains out of Ukraine. Whose rights matter is the question. If you're talking about reporting on that actual war itself and prioritization of intervention efforts made by the rest of the world in an attempt to resolve that particular conflict, you can clearly see fault lines in the approach that the world is following vis-a-vis -vis the conflicts, different violent conflicts of similar scale happening in the African continent. Tigray region in Ethiopia, for instance, being, a, being an example. The conflict in South Sudan being an example. The conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The conflict in Burkina Faso. The conflict in Central African Republic. If you move up in the Middle East, the conflict in Turkey, the conflict in Syria, here you could see clear fault lines on whose right, rights matter and whose rights do not matter. As I listen carefully and critically to the reporting on the war itself, there were statements like, these are white middle-class Europeans. These are not like Africans or people in the Middle East. It exposes to us the fault lines in that particular document to say whose rights really matter. It took the United Nations almost 30 years to actually realize that the apartheid system in South Africa was actually a crime against humanity. For the longest of times, they agreed with what the white minority violent and evil regime was doing to a senseless defense, defenseless masses of black people in South Africa. 
And the question that I keep posing is whose rights really matter? When at a time where I thought the world for once is going to be united under one banner because they now find themselves in a position where, where they have one common enemy, the pandemic. In terms of fighting that particular pandemic, in terms of offering life-saving vaccines to combat the impact of that particular pandemic on the rest of the human family, we knew whose rights matter and whose rights do not matter. We know what the people that had priority in terms of access to vaccines. It would take us almost a year before the African continent would be afforded an opportunity to have access to all these different vaccines created to protect us against this one common enemy. And if you do not know whose rights matter, and if you do not critically engage the manner in which issues are being approached on a global stage today, then there's something wrong with you. My rights do not matter. The rights of people like me do not matter. If you dispute that, you must go ask my fellow comrades and activists in arm um, in the Black Lives Matter movements and other movements that have existed on why they say Black lives do matter. And another question that I'm going to pose here today is what will it take for us to be granted equal access to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What will it take for me to enjoy the same human rights as you? What will it take for me and my people to enjoy the same human rights as you are enjoying today? What will it take? As this generation, what is our responsibility? I think we have a collective responsibility to, have, to perhaps flip the tables and decide how we want to be governed and decide how we want our present and our future to be defined. If you look at the, the systemic racism so prevalent in the American society, in South Africa, in the rest of the world today, you realize that there's still a long way to go as this generation. But at the same time, it poses the very same similar question that I posed in the, in the previous discussion at the Makati Center, which comes out of Fanon's most profound statement, each generation must discover its purpose, fulfill it or betray it, close quote. And in that particular platform, I asked my generation, what is our purpose? Given what is happening around the world, given the fact that to this day, I still do not, I'm still not afforded the same human rights as me and you, my brother. What will it take and what is our purpose? Do we still want to continue in this adversarial, unequal path, which is a recipe for disaster? or we want to carve our own path, decide what strategies and tactics are we going to use to wage a relentless struggle on all forms of injustices of our time. What will it take for me and my people to be free? What will it take for them to be afforded similar human rights? The right to live the right to equality, to be treated equal in dignity and in human rights, the right to be seen as a human, what will it take? And that is the question that I want you today when you leave and when you reflect, I want you to ask you that question, whose rights 
matter. In the world that we live in today, whose rights matter? And what are you doing in making sure that the H and everyone is afforded that right to live is afforded that right to live in a more equal, dignified way. I want you to look at the systems of governance here in the United States and the rest of the world. I want you to look at the justice system today that is skewed along racial lines and color lines and ask yourself whose rights matter. When me and you are arrested for the similar crime, but I'll be given 10 year sentence and yet they are probably given one month sentence for this similar crime. I want you to ask you a question is whose rights matter? And what can we do about that question? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandela. So I'd like to ask our panelists and Dr. Le, uh, Judge Lejeune to join us on stage to uh, have our panel discussion. Everyone who's here, and to thank Madiba for the thoughtful talk today. And we have three panelists who have some questions about the thoughts that were raised and the points that were raised. And the panel is intentionally uh, divided by generation. So as the oldest person on the moderator, but we have uh, uh, different perspectives in terms of uh, experience and thought. And when you made your comments uh, this afternoon, I thought about uh, Patrice Lumumba, who believed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and who believed that the United Nations was to be responsive and I also thought of Doug Hammershield, who believed in the declaration and believed that he should respond and uh, afford uh, Lumumba the relief that he was requesting. And both were killed. And so uh, we have some very complex values and very complex ways of interacting. And so I would like to uh, let uh, Dean Bachaway start with her uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, about 20 years ago, I, was, uh, I had the pleasure of being in the company of Nelson Mandela. He was invited by my father-in-law to receive an honorary degree from Harvard University in 1998. And sitting in the audience, I don't remember the words he said, but I remember how I felt uh, in the audience, hearing him speak, um, surrounded by an audience that just felt hope that there was something that we could do to move forward, that the, the, the evil of apartheid, that we were able to push beyond that and create a new tomorrow. And I wonder to what degree we have realized that new tomorrow um, and where the high school students, the master's students, the college students who are on this campus and many of the other campuses, where are the opportunities for us to push forward to realize that hope, that feeling that I had in 1998 uh, when, when I was in that audience, how do we move from the idea and the feeling of hope, right? We are inspired to be here in this room, but how do we commit to taking those next steps 
to realize these changes. And so I, I wonder if you might give us an example or two of where you see um, the activism taking place there in South Africa, but around the globe that are examples that we can latch on to, to say, okay, well, perhaps this is the pivot that I take in that example from South Africa that I can do right here in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dean, for that very important question. And as you are articulating the feeling that you had um, 20 years ago, when you listen to the great giant of history, such as Madiba. I was being reminded of some of the sentiments that I've shared in the panel discussion that I was, I had with my fellow activist and the leader here today, uh, Angela. And one of the sentiments that I shared with them was, it is disappointing to say today at that particular time, on that particular day, which is the 7th of April, that it was 22 years later, or 22 years ago, Nelson Mandela and his generation, in 2000, he stood and he spoke at the NWACP fundraising event. And one of the agendas of what they were talking about are the very same issues that seem to be, that were at the agenda of that part particular panel discussion organized by the Makati Center. That the issues that they were concerned about, the issues of social injustice, the issues of systemic racism and discrimination, that we were engaged on on that day, these were the very same issues that 22 years ago, that generation were concerned about. Mm -hmm. I was also saying that in that similar year on the 2nd of March, 2000, in that very same campus, the College of St. Benedict, Angela Davis, one of the greatest activists and the greatest giant of our history, was in that very same campus 22 years ago, probably talking about the very same issues that we set on that venue and we were deliberating on. Mm -hmm. How do we as this generation mobilize our efforts, organize ourselves, build bridges between our community in making sure that we protect and safeguard our present and our future from being tainted by the decisions made by the previous generation. For I said to them, slavery, colonialism, apartheid, and all these different vicious and violent systems of oppression were gifted to us by the previous generation. We did not ask for them. And the question is, how do we organize ourselves, mobilize ourselves, build bridges between our community, build bridges that cut across color lines and say enough is enough. We do not want our present and our future to be defined in the same standard as the past. How do we do that as this generation? And now there's been different various forms of social movement that have been mobilizing and organizing us as young people and say, it is high time that we decide what is our purpose and what is our agenda and how, what forms of strategies and tactics are we going to use to wage a relentless resistance against all these forms of oppression. Mm -hmm. And the movements such as Black Lives Matter, for instance, in the United States, the movements such as the Follis movement in South Africa or the Fees Must Fall movements that were calling for free, free decolonized education for the poor or the previously disadvantaged used strategies and tactics that probably were not even similar 
to the approaches and strategies that were used from that past generation. But of course, what I also argued on is to say, it has been made clear to us that if the previous generation were able to declare victory against all forms of injustices as vicious and violent as they are, slavery, colonialism, and apartheid, and they managed to turn the tide, the tide of history and afford us the limited freedom that we're enjoying today, it is possible for us as this generation to once again turn the tide of history. It is possible for us to come together. It is possible for us to follow in the very same footsteps of Martin Luther King, in the very same footsteps of Malcolm X, who said, we need to build bridges. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we need. That's where our opportunities lie as this generation. We need to begin build bridges that cut across color lines, that cut across racial lines where we say we refuse to be defined by the systems that were designed to oppress our ancestors. We refuse to live in that world that is segregated and, and polarized along racial, color, and religious lines. We refuse to abide by such systems. Mm -hmm. And we are going to chart our own path as this generation. And there are already movements that are happening across the world that we can learn from the Black Lives Matter movement in South Africa, no, in, in, in the United States and the rest of the world. The free education movement for the poor in South Africa. We look closely on how young people organize themselves to achieve some of the things that are achieved through this movement and tap into some of the opportunities that the previous generation did not have. Mm -hmm. We have access to tools such as social media that we can use to mobilize and organize ourselves and build bridges among our communities and define what our vision, purpose and mission is and how we are going to wage a relentless struggle against the injustices of our time. We have those opportunities that they did not have at that time. The question is, what is our purpose and what are we doing about the issues that confront us today? Thank I think that's how I could possibly respond to that question. Thank you. Yeah. And if I could just add one, one bit, and that is the question you may have in your mind is where do I start? And you start with taking the next step that you think is the right step for you, right? And so if you are a member of the NAACP, if you are a member of Black Lives Matter, if you are a member of an organization that is moving this work forward, start there. If you are not a member, maybe you become a member. If you have an idea that there is no organization or, or nothing that is in, in, in place, start something. The point is that you're not gonna build a bridge until, until you start to lay down the first brick. You can't wait for someone else to do it. We can't wait for someone else to do it. And so how do you move this forward? You move. You start with your passion. You start where, where your heart is, where, where you're motivated, where you have community to do this work. So thank you. I would like to ask Angela Rose a question. Uh, as an older person, we always ask, how many times are you going to watch this movie and think the ending's going to be different? So each generation tries to redefine white supremacy, redefine oppression as if it left and is coming back and is in a milder form than historically we know. Uh, can you speak from your point of view from the NAACP as a young person in terms of having a historic perspective and an approach to uh, fighting white supremacy? Yes, I mean, for me, um, I graduated college um, in 2018. I was in uh, Harlem, right? And so I came back from Harlem in New York City to uh, this community that I grew up in and one of the things that I, I was just in that same space of I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't really know what to do. I knew that 
I wanted to make a difference, that I had the capabilities of making a difference in my community. And I went to actually uh, Steve Belton over at the Urban League. And I had made a meeting with him because he was one of the only people that I you know, really knew who was doing work that I admired. And I asked him and I, I essentially almost broke down in tears. And I said, I just love this community. And I see uh, you know, how this community here that I grew up in, I see the issues that are here. What do I do? And he basically said, look, you have to start doing something, okay? <laughs> like, you have to do the type of research that's beyond the type of research that we learn in college. It's talking to people, it's being out in community, it's going to events, it's actually talking to the elders, right? And so I was connected with Leslie Redman, who was the president of the Minneapolis NAACP at the time. And I just loved her energy. I just loved that when she walked down West Broadway uh, in North Minneapolis, people would stop and say, hello, hi, Leslie. Oh, hey, what's going on? She would basically open her arms and say, hi, sister, hi, brother. You know, if you know Leslie, that's the type of person she is, just very warm, welcoming. And I was surprised to find that she wasn't even from the Twin Cities. She was from DC. And she had taken it upon herself to make the community that she had found herself in to be her community. And any issues that she saw, she, she has this, a phrase that turned into her organization called, she doesn't complain, activate. So she started her organization, don't complain, activate. And so, you know, when I started getting to know Leslie, I joined the NAACP. It was important for me to join a Black, you know, organization, a legacy Black organization that focused on uplifting the Black community in Minneapolis. It was important for me to be in an organization that had a, an ethos of it really doesn't matter how much money you make. It really doesn't matter what age you are. Uh, if you show up to the NAACP meetings, like you're welcome in a lot of ways. And we had a lot of different ideologies, right, that were present there just because we were that space where if someone had a problem, they knew to come to the NAACP. And so in that, um, I started to really familiarize myself with a history that was here that I didn't learn growing up here. Because we had 95 year old members and because we had 16 year old members, uh, I started to learn a lot about Minnesota history that I, nobody told me. Nobody told me about the lynchings in Mankato or the lynchings in Duluth, Minnesota. Nobody told me about A.A. A. Lee and the riots outside of his house. Um, trying to push him out of South Minneapolis when he moved in. Nobody told me that there was even an uprising in Minneapolis in 1968. Uh, and so it was through talking to the elders, talking to people in the NAACP, like the simple fact that I had no idea Nelson Mandela had ever come to Minnesota, right? It was, it was news to me. And to get a newspaper clipping and then to call up, you know, a Breck Buckner and to say, what, this happened? And he was like, yes, yes. And then to learn even about the NAACP and the intentional dismantling of the branch that happened afterward, you know, that was all news to me. And so that also motivated me when issues came up around the murder of George Floyd and the murder of Dante Wright, the murder of Winston Smith, the murder of Amir Locke, the same, questions, just like Dr. Mandela had mentioned, that, they, that the NAACP was struggling with. Sometimes, you know, they weren't even the best ones <laughs> handling it, but they were trying, struggling with 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 100 years ago, because this uh, chapter is over 100 years old. Um, we were started in 1914. Um, literally these issues are still the same issues that we're talking about now. So let's not fall into the same trap. Let's not fall into the same okie doke uh, with you know, the electeds in power of what we can and cannot do. Let's learn from you know, what 
uh, you know, Sharon, Mayor Sharon Sells Belton went through. Um, let's learn from, you know, what uh, Dr. Josie Johnson went through. Let's learn from what Olivia Lena Smith went through uh, in the 1930s and 40s. So that was really important to me. And I wouldn't have even acknowledged this history if I hadn't been in the NAACP, if I hadn't been exposed to, you know, this intergenerational branch that had members who, you know, they, they said, they would say, oh, they, we've been trying to do a mediation team with uh, the, uh, the Minneapolis uh, Police Department since 2003, and it hasn't happened. You know, they, they would say, we, oh, I remember in the late 90s when it was called Murderapolis, and we got the heads of the gangs at a table with Spike uh, Moss, and, you know, we were, we saw all of these things happen. And we're trying to address uh, the violence in our community in this way. We were trying to do this uh, project, this project, and I'm tell you, the elders they know their facts when it comes to the history, and I really, I really honor that, and I really find so much power in that because now, when we are trying to do something, sometimes try to reinvent the wheel as young people try to do some new fancy thing that you know we're trying to uh, get together and activate for a change we have the elders who say well we already tried that in the 1970s and this is what happened uh, we already tried that let me push you further on this and it's so important to have that um, th just that check that pulse that history because just like what you said of how you stand on your ancestors, I stand on my ancestors, but I just don't know who they are. And I don't know fully the trials that they went through. And so, you know, being in the NAACP, being in an intergenerational conversation is the only way that I've been able to make it this far and to make the change that I've been able to do in this moment. Thank you. Uh, Mark? You've been in Minnesota a long time, and we try uh, to pick up our newspaper, and we're told Minnesota is a happy place, Minnesota nice. And we disconnect ourselves from the history of Dred Scott, the history of intentionally enslaved persons, dozens of them at Fort Snelling, and the intentional uh, redlining and segregation of black communities resulting in today having less than 30% of African descendant people owning their own homes. So Mark as the former secretary of state and the head of Global Minnesota, what is your uh, suggestion in terms of the way forward in addressing our situation? Well, I so appreciate your question, putting a circle around the things that we often don't talk about. And Dr. Mandela is bringing us into a larger question of hope and generations. And maybe it's uh, the part of me that says in this moment, I'm trying to think about the intergenerational part of this, because I believe you and I are in, well, a new stage of life of a certain kind. And so when you ask me a question of what to do, the first thing that comes to me as a former Secretary of State is says, get registered and vote. Okay, that's kind of basic, NAACP mm -hmm. kind of big time on this, you know, and mm -hmm. et cetera. And I'll go back to that in a moment with a story. But I also wanna say that um, in addition to the struggles in our society that we are still 100 years, uh, 200 years, 20 years struggling with, we are also still struggling on some of the questions of philosophy and understanding in the heart of organizing. Last week was the week, the anniversary week of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King, who was for me and I think for the nation at the time, the leading voice on the question of nonviolence. And his deepening larger vision of a peaceful world that challenged what was happening in Vietnam of a world of justice for janitors and for street maintenance and for the people who were 
carrying the garbage out in Memphis. These things brought him into danger. He knew it, he spoke about it, his most famous speech in a way. But it was a time of deep debate about violence and nonviolence at the core of organizing. This was a very big debate in South Africa also. And President Nelson Mandela's life is one that I think about in the context of the voice of nonviolence and of course, Gandhi and others. But to this moment today, this question of violence and nonviolence stays centered to many conversations because of the anger, the frustration, the repeated attacks, the danger, the murders. The, Fred Hampton was my age when he was murdered, and so it had the biggest impact on me. That's kind of how we are wired as people. Uh, but Dr. Martin Luther King was a Southern Baptist preacher, and I was grown up in the Southern Baptist tradition, and so it was shocking as well. And I remember those feelings and that debate about violence and nonviolence at the core of some of our organizing, we have to continue that debate. Back when the state was getting organized, so this is you know more than 150 years ago, we were in the middle of the Civil War, in the middle of the period where we were beginning to really debate. And um, the state had to come up with a constitution. We weren't a state yet, we were just a territory. So we had to come up with a constitution and send that off to Congress in Washington and they had to say, okay, and then we could become a state. And so just to preface the story, I was an elected democratic secretary of state, but showing up in St. Paul for that task was a whole bunch of Republicans and a whole bunch of Democrats. And the two bodies, broke into fights and battles and they divided and they wrote two constitutions. The Republican party at the time, the party of Lincoln, the party of the North, so to speak, had very strong language that was continuing the right of freed African-American men to vote, not mentioning women, big, big, big took another hundred years. The Democratic party constitution suggestion took away the right of free African-American men to vote. And there was a huge battle about this and it got sent off to Washington. They sent it back say, you can only send us one. And so they had a compromise committee. The Republicans compromised and allowed that Democratic party language to prevail, taking away the right to vote for freed African-American men. But their part of the compromise was a relatively simple and low bar for amending the Constitution. And then they took the next decade and made three attempts and eventually successfully amended the Constitution to restore the right of free African American men to vote. Somewhere in the middle, the Democrats were afraid they might win. And so they latched onto it, the right of women to vote because they knew that would knock it down. So, you know, these were the days. But that low bar has remained and it was used while I was Secretary of State in an attempt to make it much harder for youth, for students, for seniors, for African-Americans to vote in our state. So the history of how things evolve in an organizing sense around power are sometimes more complicated than they look on the outside. And when you dig in, you go, that's interesting. That's interesting. But each of those moments, it took people not being discouraged, not giving up, compromising to get something done and then going right back at it and trying to understand the role of things like violence and nonviolence in an organizing sense. And I feel like if what we can do is inspire each other to get up tomorrow and the next day and to get organized and to ask friends and colleagues, hey, are you registered to vote? Hey, are you participating in the process? You know, asking friends and organizing, hey, you saw that thing of, of community gardens up on the north side, have you gone up there? 
asking those questions of yourself, but your colleagues, your roommates, your classmates and friends, because it's the one thing that can stop you and slow you and grind you down if you're feeling like it's by yourself. Having someone like Dr. Mandela willing to come all the way over here and share his time and come step away from very important work means to me that he is reminding me of my responsibility in reaction to his taking time to come and help us think deeper, to come and inspire us, to remind us. And this is what I hope that my alma mater, the Humphrey School right here, keeps leading us into opportunities for inspiration, for reminding each other, for stimulating those debates, whether it's over strategy or what do we do. I need your help in understanding what this social media thing might mean for organizing. Because mm -hmm. when I am not able to get around the way I might want to, I might still be able to type fast if I knew what I was typing and where to type it and where to send it. So keep those debates going about the challenges and the organizing, but keep each other and keep your heart pumping and yourself inspired. My friend, Judge LeJune Lang has been inspiring me in this work for a long time. But when she starts to tell stories, then you're not just inspired, you like, oh, I got to get going here because she has given me a picture of whose shoulders I'm standing on and who are watching to make sure that who's behind me feels just as inspired to keep going as our generation, I think, feels inspired at this moment. Thank you. I think all of you, uh, hopefully you'll take some mental notes from uh, former Secretary of State, Mark Ritchie. The period in the 1860s in Minnesota, we could call making lemonade because less than 1,000 black men were told they had to convince 70,000 white people across the state of Minnesota to amend the constitution. So it was like rolling the rock up the hill, but they organized, they figured out how to do it. They cut hair in the barbershop and whispered in the ear of the people with influence. They got petitions, went across the state and three after three attempts got the job done and never stopped, never stopped. So I think with regard to what uh, Dr. Mandela has given as a charge in terms of human rights for everyone, regardless of whether they're on the African continent, on the, in South America, not just in Europe. I think we understand that we all can be citizens working on human rights. And we're going to uh, ask Dr. Mandela to talk about how students with the benefit of the internet and cell phone can raise and keep areas that are not having the international gaze in front of them. As the Honorary Council for South Africa, I received an email from a U Ukrainian woman without a title behind her name saying, this is what's happening to the African students medical students and college students who were trying to board trains. And she just stepped up as a citizen and contacted every embassy to let them know so that we could mobilize and raise the alarm. And so how, what is your message for the students to be able to look at Tigray, look at uh, Syria, look at places where the national gaze is not there? What is your advice? At about time for the conversation. So we're, we do have res, um, refreshments in the forum. And so I'd lo love for us to hear uh, this comment and then we can continue the conversation uh, in the forum as okay. we close. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judge. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for 
such a wonderful story as well, uh, my, my dear leader. Um, and I think uh, my, I'm sorry for not leaning much to what our senior citizens uh, uh, and esteemed panelists are saying, but constantly uh, leaning towards what my fellow leader and activist uh, was saying in terms of uh, her sentiments. Uh, somewhere in her remarks, she spoke of uh, the deliberate steps that she has taken in learning from the great heroes and heroines of our, of our past in terms of the kind of struggles that they fought against and the kind of strategies and tactics that they were using. And such played a significant role in influencing the kind of a leader that she is today. And I think that is very particularly important because I fully agree with her to say, as young people, we have a reservoir of knowledge and wisdom of how the past generations wage their own, the struggles of their times, the strategies and tactics that they used, what worked and what did not work in the social movements that they were driving, fighting against all these forms of injustices that we are still embedded with today. And I think with that, it gives us an opportunity to know what strategies we can adopt from the previous generation that worked for us. I like that because it also means to us that even at the time when they were waging their own struggles, that generation, the question of age and the question of gender and the question of the color of their skin did not matter at that time. What mattered is how they wanted to define their present and how they wanted their future to be defined. I had an opportunity in 2018 to visit uh, the then Senator uh, John Lewis and have a conversation with him. And I was asking him particularly one question. How did you at the age of 23 manage to speak and to be an activist that you were in that uh, 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 march to uh, Washington in 1963? And he spoke so much. And one of the things that I have captured and I've also captured on some of the documentaries that were uh, made of his legacy is the need for us to cause good trouble as this generation. And there's one thing that I'll tell you, and it's something that I told the, the, the other platform that we're speaking in at the Makati Center, that the fellow that inspired me, Nelson Mandela, his real name that the rest of the world doesn't know is Holy Tata, that means pulling the branch, which in my language means the troublemaker. We ought to cause trouble because that's the only way we can bring about the change that we want to see. And by the way, the change that we want to see, we are that change. Yes. It begins by realizing that we are who we have been waiting for. There is no Messiah as it was prophesied in the Bible that will come and salvage us from all the different forms of injustice so prevalent in our world today. We are who we have been waiting for. We have an opportunity to learn from the past generations, their strategies and tactics, but we also have the opportunity to define and, 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 strat and define what our purpose, our vision, our mission, and which strategies are we going to employ, violent and nonviolent. Now I say that very underlined, violent and nonviolent. We ought to be pragmatic on what is working for us, and we ought to organize ourselves and define what strategies that we are going to use. But it begins by asking critical good questions about the order of today, the manner in which we are governed, the manner in which we are organized. If we begin by asking critical questions, such as the questions that I was asking in the podium, 
whose rights matter? When we begin to ask those questions, we, we already begin to enter into a territory where we identify fault lines in these systems. And this is where these are the fault lines that we ought to channel our energies, channel our resistance in addressing. Now we're talking about systemic racism. We're talking about discrimination. We're talking about the justice system being skewed along color and race lines. Those are the questions that we must begin to ask. And when you ask those questions, the next question is, how do we respond? That's where we enter the territory of how are we going to organize and mobilize ourselves and channel our energies to address the issues that affect us in this generation. And I said it somewhere, and I'm saying it now once again, we owe the next generation this much to at least try. That is what we owe them. And I said it last time, and I'm going to say it today, I do not want my children to be battling with the same, very same issues 15 years, 20 years, 100 years from now. It would be a shame that they will still be battling with the same issues. And my children will ask me a question, Daddy, what did you do? Mm. You and your generation, what did you do in making sure that we do not suffer the same fate as our forefathers and as your generation did? But it is possible. It's possible to change the tide of history. Right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. like to say thank you to everyone. Dean Bachaway, thank you for hosting us and making this such a good meeting. And Angela Rose, Dr. Mandela, and Mark Ritchie, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us in the forum for uh, reception and more conversation uh, and questions uh, for all of our panelists, especially Dr. Mandela. Thank you.